everyone. This is Anna Kachikian from the Armenian Report. This is a different style of interview during a very different time in our lives when the entire world is fighting a global pandemic and our lives have been put on pause and our events have been canceled. Well, back before this whole thing began, on March 1st, 2020, I recorded an exclusive interview with a very special woman, and I cannot wait to introduce our community and the world to her. Her name is Nadine Arslanian. She is the fiancé of Senator Bob Menendez, the senior U.S. senator from New Jersey who went up on the Senate floor over and over and over again until the U.S. Senate recognized the Armenian Genocide. Yes, standing beside Senator Menendez was an Armenian woman championing him. Nadine's story is going to make you cry. It's going to make you laugh. It's going to make you smile. It's going to fill you up with feelings of resilience and grit and anger and frustration and joy and commitment. She surprised me with her story. She took me through a roller coaster of emotions, and I cannot wait to share this with all of you. I cannot wait for the world to hear her story, to meet her. I cannot wait for everyone to be so inspired by her. And I can't thank her enough for giving the Armenian Report the opportunity to share this story. As I said earlier, this is a little different because it is an audio interview. So bear in mind that you mainly will just see images and audio waves. However, there are little surprises in between that I do not want you guys to miss. There are certain things that she mentions that she has shared with the visual aspect of those things. So I encourage you to, yes, keep your eye on the screen and uh, make sure you do not miss those little uh, surprises that she has agreed to share with our viewers. This interview is brought to us by three Armenian-owned businesses. Our first brand partner is the Nazarian Group. Here's their story. During the genocide, approximately 20,000 people from the region of Hajin were deported. Of the deportees was a teenager named Hambartum Nazarian. Hambartum didn't just stand back, he fought on the Turks that massacred 85 people from his family of 88. He and two others were the only standing survivors from his family. Hambartum settled in the Armenian quarter of Jerusalem, where he opened a copper-making shop and started a family. His eldest son, Harutun Nazarian, moved to Lebanon in 1957 and started his own family. In 1967, Harutun moved his family to United States, fleeing the Lebanese Civil War. Striving for a better life, Harutun worked as a property manager so his children can receive a proper education. In 1981, Vartan Nazarian started a construction business with his father Harutun and completed projects for Caltrans. Fast forward to the year 2000, the Nazarian Group, a three-generation family-owned company, was established, ready to take on modernizing schools into the 21st century. The Nazarian Group is a general contracting company that serves the greater Los Angeles area, primarily public works projects in the educational sector. TNG's specialty is modernization with an emphasis in electrical, carpentry, flooring, and HVAC. Moreover, Vartan Nazarian, president of the Nazarian Group, has a passion and a strong desire to be involved in the Armenian community. His motto has always been, work hard so that you are able to give back to your community. Some of Vartan's greatest accomplishments are constructing or renovating buildings within his own community, such as St. Peter Armenian Apostolic Church, St. Leon Armenian Cathedral, AGBU Manukyan Demergian Preschool, Tekeyan Cultural Center, and many more. Additionally, Vartan supports modern Armenia and Artsakh with various benevolent missions and investments in farming and tourism. Today, approximately 100 years later, the Nazarian group is thriving at an unprecedented rate because of Hambartum Nazarian's sacrifice and will to live. His perseverance is a testament to our survival. Our next brand partner is Havid Nagan. Havid Nagan is a Swiss-made watch company based in Los Angeles combining traditional Armenian design with modern watchmaking technologies. 
Their watches are a design culmination of the ancient and ornamented Armenian culture and contemporary horological techniques. Havid Nagan will provide a value proposition across all of its complications far beyond their price point. Aren Bazerhanyan, the company's founder and CEO, has put over two years of research development into the brand's debut model. When I asked him what the brand's name meant, he told me it was a commercialized iteration of the Armenian word Havidenagan, meaning eternity or unending time. The logo is representative of the Armenian flower symbolizing eternity and prosperity. Their debut model has already garnered a growing waiting list, so visit their website havidnagan.com or email them directly at info at havidnagan.com to stay updated as they progress and get closer to releasing their first watch. And lastly, we have Arutunian and Associates. Maggie Arutunian at Arutunian and Associates represents influencers and social media personalities in drafting, reviewing, and negotiating advertising contracts with huge companies like YouTube, Google, and some of the biggest beauty brands in the world. Head over to her website, arutunianlaw.com, or her Instagram at maggie underscore Arutunian to check out some of the personalities she represents. We want to thank our brand partners for continuing to support the Armenian Report during these uncertain times. And we encourage our viewers to support Armenian-owned businesses. Please make sure you are subscribed to the Armenian Report on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and you are supporting us, you are following us, and you are sharing the Armenian Report with your community, your friends, and your family. Thank you, and let's get started. Hi, Nadine. Welcome to the Armenian Report. Hi, Anna. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. And one day, hopefully, meeting you in person. Likewise. Thank you for being so kind and giving me this interview. I really appreciate it because during our intro call is when I realized what an incredible story we're about to hear on the Armenian Report. So this means a lot to me. Thank you. Yeah. I can't wait for everyone to hear this. But let's get <laughs> right into it and learn about you. Please introduce yourself. Who is Nadine? Both my parents are Armenian. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. And uh, during the Civil War, we fled Lebanon to Greece, to London, and came to the United States and stayed in Palo Alto, California for oh. about seven months. <laughs> and, and then uh, moved to New York. And so, uh, I went to NYU undergraduate and graduate school, and I majored in international politics and French culture and civilization. And I have two kids, both of whom started nursery school at Hovnanyan Armenian School in New Jersey, but both ended up at French school. Uh, Sabine, my daughter, who graduated NYU Dean's List, I did wow. not graduate this what she did. And my son, Andre, who is at Northeastern and will be graduating this May and uh, will be working at Goldman Sachs in Boston. Wow. Nate, congratulations. That's a, <laughs> that's a huge accomplishment. <laughs> wow, Thank you must you. be so proud. So proud of my kids. Yeah. Share some of the stories you heard from your parents and grandparents about the Armenian genocide growing up. It is, um, it's hard because the last few years I had never heard stories in such detail from my father. Um, uh, and, uh, he was telling me the story of, because, uh, my paternal grandparents passed away before I was born. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my dad has always been so pro pro Armenian. Every single Sunday he goes to Holy Martyrs. Armenian church in Bayside, when we used to travel in the summers with the family from Beirut, whatever city we were in, my dad would find an Armenian church in the city that we were in, and that someday we had to go to that church. My mom was also very Armenian, but, you know, spoke it. Both my kids also speak and uh, read and write Armenian, along with French, English, and Spanish. Incredible. And... Uh, but um, the story that was I had asked my dad about, because he doesn't talk about a lot, is um, he had said, I asked him how they ended up in Beirut, and uh, he said that um, when 
the Turks started massacring the Armenians. My paternal grandfather knew that they were all going to be killed. So my dad had uh, his dad and two brothers and a sister. And uh, the, my great-grandfather sent my grandfather and the two brothers. And I asked my dad why his the sister didn't go. And he said she had just gotten married and uh, they had a few months old baby and uh, they knew that she couldn't make it traveling. So they stayed with her, her husband and the newborn. And uh, she supposedly was very pretty like most Armenian girls and she had long hair. And uh, my dad was telling me the story that uh, the Turks came and hung her by her hair from a tree branch. And he said in the old days when somebody was, you know, they they hung them by the neck. If the branch breaks, the law is that you let that person free. And uh, they tied her by her hair and a branch broke and they retied her by her hair. And uh, they uh, killed her husband in front of her. And uh, and then there were two, a little boy and a little girl who watched the whole thing. And then they took her little boy and they killed him in front of her. And then they put water all over her and they put skin of animals on her so that it dries on her. Oh While she was alive and they killed mm-hmm. her parents and... Uh, the leather dried on her skin and then uh, that's how she died and my grandfather my maternal grandfather wrote three books by hand and I still have them I can't get past the third chapter and he writes down all his memories of when him his mom and his sister were going in circles on the snow and the Turkish army was making them walk round and round. And he would say if somebody, you know, couldn't walk, they would beat them and leave them behind. And his mom couldn't carry both kids at the same time. She was taking turns and his sister was older. And he had some kind of infection where he couldn't see. The only, they didn't have anything on them. But supposedly they said if you put your own urine it makes your eyes better. And his sister kept saying, please, please let my brother survive. Mm. And uh, he got better. He got most of his eyesight back. But walking around, my great-grandmother couldn't hold them both. And since she was older, she fell. His sister fell from the mom's arms. And they beat my great-grandmother, and she had to leave the daughter behind, and they slashed her. And my grandfather, she carried him, and then she couldn't walk anymore, and somebody else picked him up to keep walking in circles, and his mom was just beaten and left behind. So he lost his sister, his mom, and... His dad was killed. So it's very hard every time I pick up to read it. And he became an orphan. But every time I pick up his book to try to read it, I can't get through it. And it's episodes of his life. And he wrote two and a half notebooks. And he uh, came to Columbia and got his PhD. And he wrote about one of his thesis was about... um, what happened to the Ottoman Empire. And he was the principal of BUC College in Beirut. And then they sent him to get his PhD from Columbia. And I went when I was at NYU to Columbia Library and I looked it up and I found it and made a photocopy uh-huh. of oh it. Oh my gosh. Uh-huh. But, Those um, journals that he wrote, were they, uh, I'm assuming in Armenian, right? 
No, they were in English, but it has mm-hmm. Armenian. Yeah, it has Armenian in it, but he wrote them in English. And they asked me quite a few times. They wanted them published um, yeah. for the hundred year anniversary of the genocide, but because mm-hmm. I could not get through reading them and I didn't know what was in there, and they were so detailed. It's mm-hmm. the only thing I have of my grandfather, and I would not give them up. I made yeah. photocopies of them, but they wanted the originals to display, and it's the only thing I have left of him. So I still have them. It's very, very hard when when I think of what they went through. And uh, my daughter goes, Sabine goes to sometimes to the cathedral in New York City on mm-hmm. Saturdays, and she teaches, you know, the little kids. She volunteers to help them read and write and teach them about, you know, Armenian culture and whatever mm-hmm. they need her to do. She's very, very involved. Well, you know, my next question was going to be, how has the survival of genocide shaped you as an adult? But question for me now is, it's so evident that the the wound is so open. It is. The tragedies that I remember, the stories of, you know, what my grandparents went through and from both sides of the family. And I never knew why my dad always said his lucky number is 13, his favorite number is 13. So between both my parents, we lost 13 immediate members of the family. I'm thinking about it. It's really left an unbelievable indelible mark on my memory. I personalize the genocide every time I think of the stories, what my parents went through, what my great-grandparents went through, all the family we lost. And uh, that's why it was so important to me that my dad is the sole survivor, that he sees that the Armenian Genocide Resolution got passed. You have been silently cheering your fiancé, Senator Bob Menendez, as he's been resiliently pushing for the recognition of the Armenian Genocide in the U.S. Senate. So, so congratulations. And Thank you. <laughs> December 12, 2019 was a historic day for us all. But it's important for me to introduce the Armenian Report audience, the champion standing beside Senator Menendez. Where were you that day? What were you doing? He is the champion. The second time he tried, he passed it, that he didn't pass it. He tried. I was in Washington with him the first and second time. It didn't pass. It I took it very, very badly, and so did my father. The, on December 11th, I was in Washington that week. On December 11th, it was a Wednesday. I came home early because well, we well, weren't sure if it was going to pass or not. Nadine, really quickly, we should let people know that that December 12th was the fourth time he went up there. So there yes. was the first, second, third, and fourth time is when it got passed. So, yes. so you're saying the fourth time, which was December 11th, is when December 11th, the fourth okay. time is when I came home on Wednesday because if it was going to be um, denied again, I was not going to take it very well. I was very, very upset, and my dad is 90 years old, and the only thing my dad wanted, he always said, my grandfather, uh, my paternal grandfather's dream was to have the world recognize what we went through. So the only, my dad never asked for anything. So I said, okay. He said, honey, you go home and you watch it from the TV because it would have been easier for me to not be in Washington. So I was home at quarter to one, glued Mm -hmm. to the TV, and I was anxiously waiting to see if it was going to be a breakthrough and if we were going to get it passed. And when he passed it, I had tears of joy. I couldn't believe it. I was so, so happy, but also I was stunned. I was home alone because (laughs) I didn't know what was going to happen. It was the fourth time, and I was glued to the TV. And when it passed, after it passed, I could not even call him, and he did not call me. It was, I think it was 2.38, I remember. 
he sent me a text. And usually right after it passes and gets denied, whatever it is, he immediately calls me when yeah. he gets off on the floor. <laughs> and it was 2.38. And he sent me something, and I printed it, and I read it a lot. And it says, truth, perseverance, and a commitment to a cause greater than yourself. In honor of your family and all who suffered, I hope your father was watching. And on the bottom, he wrote in Armenian, never forget. And it wasn't until 2.38 that he was able to send me a text, and I couldn't still respond to him because I was so happy, but I was so shook up. Oh, my God. That got me. That got me. <laughs> um, was that a text he sent you? He did. He sent me the text. A text. We couldn't even talk. It was maybe... After five o'clock, when he was able to pick up the phone, and I was able to pick up the phone to talk, I was so happy, and I still remember as if it was this morning when he looked up and he said, "It's important that it passes while family is still alive and can recognize it. We shouldn't wait until there isn't a single survivor left to recognize the Armenian genocide." And I knew right there and then that he was talking about my dad. I am thankful that this resolution has passed at a time in which there are still survivors of the genocide. <clears throat> we'll be able to see the Senate acknowledges what they went through. With that, Madam President, <clears throat> I yield the floor. How much so, were you involved? How, like, how were you able to help him through this? Passing the Armenian uh, genocide was trying to have it recognized was something that he's been working on passing for, I think, 20 years now. I think just he, he always believed in it before even me, but hearing the personal history of my family, what my both my mom and my dad's side of the family went through, how very, very poor Armenian we are, how, you know, in all the generations, it was very important that we speak Armenian and know the culture and go to Armenian church. I knew what it meant to my father, and I think him knowing it, he really wanted to do it. He knew how much it would mean to Armenians, mm -hmm. and he was more introduced personally in the Armenian community, and every single Armenian was saying the same thing. It's very important to us. It's important to us for what our torture that our families went through, that it be recognized. And uh, it was a very big challenge for him mm -hmm. to do it in the Senate, but I think that I knew that he would do it, and it was very, very important. I know you briefly kind of mentioned it. As I said, this was the fourth time he went up there. But at any point, one of you think about giving up. And I think this is the message of, like, not giving up. But I want to I wanna kind of hear the process, like, what happens, especially in a relationship, right? When one person is like, no, I'm still going. The other person's like, you've done this three times already. And it's like, doesn't matter. I'm going to keep pushing at this. Or, you know, how did, how did that dynamic work out? How did that play out? This is something that he believed in for, like I said, for 20 years. But I was so, so disappointed the first time when he told me he was going to introduce it. I didn't think there was a chance that it wasn't going to pass. I was so disappointed. And for him, when he realized how much it meant to so many people, uh, neither of us gave up. And at one point, I said to him, how could the Senate not pass this? How could you not recognize it? And neither of us ever gave up. I know there were some Armenians, neighbors of mine, who said he'd never get it passed because it's been so long and it's never passed. But I know when he puts something in his mind and he believes in it, he doesn't stray. So I had no doubt at all that he was going to get it passed. I was just hoping it would be 
during a time when my dad was around to see it because mm -hmm. I told them if it passes a day after my dad's not around, it won't mean the same to me. I knew he would do it and he never gives up on something. There are a lot of young Armenians listening to this who have a dream and a goal, but they're surrounded by, you know, family members, neighbors, friends who are, you know, non-believers, naysayers of theirs. This was huge, right, for Senator Menendez and for you. What kind of advice do you have to the people? It's like, how do you block out the naysayers? What do you do? How do you, how do you not let them get to your subconscious? How do you block them out? What do you do, especially if they're family? I asked him once. I said, you know, I was really disappointed. Some people don't think it's going to pass. And he goes, what do you think? I said, I know you. I know you will get it passed. And he said... He said, challenge non-believers with the truth, because he always says the truth is ultimately prevails. And I really believed when even he said on the Senate floor, I have 53 Republicans, every week one of you is going to come down and is going to veto on behalf of the president. He said, I will be here 53 weeks in a row. And I'm not going to stop. And he goes, you will go down in history on that you're on the wrong side of history and what you believe and what you stood for. And when he said that, I had goosebumps because mm -hmm. I knew right there and then that I was 100% right in believing in what he said. And I think that the Republicans weren't going to be able to sustain objecting to something that was to a historical fact, and every single week when he was on the Senate floor for four weeks in a row, he would always ask for the unanimous consent, but he would always go through historical realities, historical facts with American ambassador, British ambassador, you know, famous people that were there that spoke about it. And he used to say, there's going to be a time that nobody's going to be able to sustain the truth and mm -hmm. they're going to have to give in, but I'm not giving up until they do. I'm happy you brought that President Trump up because that was my next question, which is President Trump said that he has not changed his stance on the matter, regardless of what the House and the Senate vote. How does that impact the Armenian cause? Because I know there was a lot of confusion um, because it was like, well, what does the president say? You know, Can you kind of explain that and how does that impact the Armenian cause now? The fact that the United States Congress, as the voice of the American people, passed the resolution and accepts it, nothing can diminish that. And it's sad that President Trump doesn't want to acknowledge it, but it will forever and ever be written in our history, the, the United States history, that Congress recognized the Armenian genocide. Of course, it would be great if President Trump himself would recognize the history, the pain that we went through, the torture that we went through, but nothing is going to change the fact that it's recognized by the Congress and that is the voice of the American people. What would change if the president acknowledges it? it the doesn't relationship change. with Turkey? It, or? Well, well, President Trump, from what I believe, is he does not want to upset the president of Turkey, Erdogan, by recognizing it. But in the times that Bob presented it on the Senate floor, he said so many of our NATO allies who have recognized uh, the Armenian genocide, they're still in NATO and they still do, you know, perfect trades with Turkey. So just because we are recognizing it, Donald Trump was saying that it would ruin our, you know, relationship with Turkey, which is not true because the other NATO allies all recognize the Armenian genocide and they're doing perfect business. Mm -hmm. So, and none of them bought the missiles from Russia, which Turkey was not allowed to do as a NATO ally, and they still bought the Russian missiles when they weren't supposed to, and now they want to buy American missiles. So, if anything, President Trump should be looking out for Americans instead of defending and constantly being on Turkey's side. And President Erdogan publicly stated that 
my fiance is blacklisted in Turkey and is not allowed to set foot on Turkish soil. Which is so your ancestral I soil. I a badge of honor. So yeah. <laughs> I said, well, you know, that's wear it as a badge of honor. Seriously. But. <laughs> What's next? What do you think is next? After, after uh, you know, this huge accomplishment, what's next? I think so many people are asking that question. Like, what does this mean? What's next? Yeah, quite a few people have asked me that. And for me, the only cause I had was I wanted the recognition of the Armenian genocide. Um, people ask me, well, what's the next thing? What are you pushing him to do, or backing him up to do? What would you like to see? And for me, the one and only thing I wanted was the recognition of the Armenian genocide. He has a lot of causes. He's very, very caring, almost to a fault, uh, because he goes nonstop. But whatever he does, I just support him. And this is something he had started 20 years ago. But I really wanted this to be passed. And I would have been happy if President Trump had recognized it, but I don't need his recognition because it's forever in our history here. Yes. I mean, the president comes and goes, right? It's yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's not going to change. It's not going to change the validity of it. Mm -hmm. did, did you feel like this was the beginning of healing for you? I think it, it, it helps a lot because I feel like the stories that I hear and all the torture it makes it it makes people more aware of what happened all these armenians who were tortured who were you know separated from the families and the grotesque way i even read how you know a, a lot of the armenian young girls who were pregnant they would cut out the stomach and you mm -hmm. know kill the fetus the turkish army would i feel like a lot of people would not have known about it and if it wasn't recognized that maybe they would doubt it and yeah. for me it, it's it's we were tortured our families were tortured um they were massacred at least let the world realize what we went through not that it goes you know unread and unnoticed and i know in my children's school they had a time in history class, and it was during several grades where they had an entire week dedicated to teaching the Armenian genocide. And my Which children school is went this? to the Lycée Francais in Manhattan. Oh, okay. So and it was part of their, uh, even though it's a French school, yeah. it was part of the history in history class that they learned it. You know, I always say, I'm not looking for your acknowledgement. It's just don't deny it. Yes, that makes, a, that's a very, very, when somebody denies it, it's so hurtful because I remember stories and their stories told. It's not even I was there to see what happened. And it's very, very hurtful. And I lived through the Civil War in Lebanon. So I know what war is, and it was nothing, nothing, nothing close to a genocide. Yeah. So it's very hurtful when people don't acknowledge it. So Nadine, I sent you two bonus questions that I wasn't sure if you'd be willing to talk uh, on these topics. One of them is actually an exclusive, and the other one is an important uh, conversation for uh, for young Armenians. So my first question, though, I was so excited, and we're finally going to get the confirmation on this, is there's an Armenian news site that published a story about Senator Menendez growing up with an Armenian nanny named Anush. Can you please confirm this story for us? I have to tell you, two days after the Armenian uh, genocide resolution was passed, I got a phone call from one of my cousins in Lebanon. And she said, oh, you know, we're so proud of him. We know what he did. You know, did you ever meet Anush? I go, what? <laughs> she goes, Anush. I said, who's Anush? And she goes, his nanny. Well, I was, I have to tell you, shocked. And and since then, I, ha I was asked this question on Sunday. And I was asked this question on Friday. And we both 
uh, Bob and I have been asked this question, and I looked at him, and I was like, no, no, you can't answer this question yet. But I was so surprised, and you had brought it up first, but you're going to be the first one to make this public. He has yes. no idea of an Anush. He has no idea who she is. He never, ever had a nanny, and he grew up very, very poor in a tenement in Union City. And uh, This is a fake story? It's a fake story. (sighs) There is no Anush. There never was. He never had a nanny. And uh, (laughs) he said, where is this coming from? In Union City, there was an area where there were Armenians and there were Syrians. But I, all the years that, you know, I knew him and I'd, heard, you know, spoken to family, nobody ever said anything about a nanny. So I specifically asked him. And when we were asked to gather the question on Sunday and Friday and he looked at me, I said, you're going to have to wait for the answer. But no, <laughs> they could they could not. There's no way that they could have afforded anything. And he never had a nanny. He had... Uh, an older sister, and he has an older brother. But between the three of them, nobody ever had an Annie. And I oh. don't know where this video came from, and but I saw a partial of it. And from her accent, she it's an Armenian from Armenia lady. But nowhere in her conversation does she mention him or babysitting him or the family or anything like that. So I have no idea where the story came from but it's zero percent it it, it, it's it's a it's a very detailed story too and we well we were asked twice this just this weekend but since passing the armenian genocide the first time i heard about it was from you and i was like what this can't be never mentioned the nanny he would have said something uh you know i grew up my sister and i are uh, 14 months apart we're just two sisters and mm-hmm. we had both both of each of us at the same time had nannies so I grew up with two nannies and we're only 14 months apart and he always used to say you know two nannies uh, it was nothing that he can picture or conceive so when the story came out I said he never told me about his nanny but that you know <laughs> you're 14 months apart and you have two nannies so it was very strange, and I don't know why it came up. But on Friday, because it came up Sunday and it came up Friday, we we just looked at each other, and I was mm-hmm. smiling. And the gentleman on Friday said, well, can I say that it's true? And I said, no. Really? He goes, so it's not true? I said, no, I didn't say that either. We're not giving you an answer yet. You will hear about it next week. <laughs> but he, where he grew up in Union City, there was an Armenian church and a small Armenian community, but he never had a nanny. And I said, well, do you remember anybody named Anush? And he goes, no, <laughs> I would tell you. And he has a very, very good memory. Uh, so there's no, no friend, no family friend, nothing? Nobody named Anush. But I even asked, you know, other family members, and they never had a nanny. They never had, you know, a sitter. Um, you know, he had great parents. His mom worked very, very hard, but they did not. Okay. Not well, all. there you have it, folks. <laughs> Senator yes, Menendez there has you never... have it. Ask Anna. Senator Menendez, my perfect fiance, never had a nanny, and nobody in his family ever had a nanny. So I definitely want to know this answer from you. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, my gosh. I'm telling you, I don't you, know it how it very... came about. I, uh, I, I do not know how the story came about. <laughs> I said, it's okay, honey. If you made fun of me all this time saying, oh, you know, what did this nanny do? What did she that, that do? And and you had a nanny. It's okay. Like, <laughs> he looks at me very, very, you know, in the face that, wait, me, nanny, no. And uh, they grew up very, very poor. You know, his parents were from Cuba. And he was the first. A member of his entire family to go, even to go to college. Amazing. And the way he got into politics was because, I don't know if you know the story. No, I don't. This probably backs up more the fact that they didn't have an Annie. When he was in high school, 
he was always very, very smart. And he um, had the grades to go into an honors class. But to go into the honors class, you had to buy the book. And the books he needed, I think, were $200 as a senior. Mm -hmm. And he was so happy that, you know, he excelled and he could be in an honors class, but he could not afford the, his parents could, didn't have $200 for the books. So the principal said, you cannot be in the class. And he said, but wait, I have the grades. I qualify to be in the class. And he was very always eager to learn. And they said, we're sorry, you can't be in the class because you have to be able to afford the books. Wow. So what he did is he started a petition. And he caused such chaos that they gave him the books so that he could be in the honors class. And his yeah, mom couldn't speak English. And when she came home after school, she would make Bob recite the homework to her. And he would tell me that he'd be, Mom, you don't understand English. Why do you want me to recite the homework to you and go over it? And mm -hmm. she would tell him in Spanish, you think I don't know English. I want to hear what it is because she mm -hmm. was so into education. And mm -hmm. he knew that his mom didn't understand it, but he would still go over the homework and recite it um, to make her happy. And she made him do it so that she knew that he was doing the homework and listening, even though she didn't understand anything. So for him to even go through all this, as she was so into educa uh, being having kids educated and believed in education, and he was the first one that was going to go to college, that they didn't have money for the books. So if they didn't have money for books, how are they going to get a nanny? Yeah. When he caused so much chaos and the school board gave him the books, he had two other friends who also were smart, and they qualified to take honors, but mm -hmm. they, their families couldn't have, uh, didn't have the money either. Mm -hmm. So he said that wasn't right, and that's what made him go into, into politics. Po the politics of, for the school board, and he mm -hmm. fought for every single child at 19 years old, for every single child who can has the grades to go to honors, and they can't afford the books, they should be allowed to go into honors class and uh, it can't be because my parents don't have money, I can't take honors. And that's how he started. He, From when he was young, he always fought for the underprivileged and uh, people that had, you know, the brains, had the capability, had the motivation, but didn't have the money. And he said, if it wasn't for that, you know, he would have never been. And he always says, child of Cuban immigrants, first want to go to college, for you to tell me that one day I would be one of 100 senators representing 340 million people, but nobody would have believed it. You must be so proud of your fiancé, rightfully so. I am the, so proud of him. <laughs> and my last bonus bonus question brings me to this exact conversation that I wanted to have with you that you have very openly agreed to have a dialogue with me about this, which is young Armenian men and women dating people who are not deniers of the genocide, but better yet supporters of the cause, whether that's Armenian or non-Armenian. Could we kind of get into that conversation about the modern day dating culture as far as when it comes to Armenians and dating? For me, I would, I 100% believe it doesn't matter if a man is Armenian or he's not Armenian. What's important for me, like it was so important for me with Bob, is he recognizes what we went through. He recognizes the Armenian genocide. He supports our culture. He supports the history of what we went through. And he doesn't deny what happened like President Trump does. He believes in everything Armenian. And that to me is very, very important. If I had met Bob and he did not recognize the Armenians or the Armenian genocide, well, my fiance is perfect, so that would not happen. But if uh, if somebody um, had was dating or met somebody that didn't r recognize the Armenian genocide, 
I don't know that for me that relationship would work. Yeah. Because it's very, very important, especially, you know, when I have family and I hear the stories, it's more important that he is not Armenian, but that he recognizes what we went through, accepts it, and uh, that is very important to me. I see. What you're saying is that it it's less important the person is Armenian versus, you know, someone who doesn't support our culture. Supporting the culture and understanding the culture and loving the culture is far more important than the yeah, person it, being Armenian. It doesn't matter that he's not Armenian. If he's yeah. not Armenian, but he recognizes the Armenian genocide, he recognizes what we went through, he supports our culture, he supports our history, he, he believes in what we went through, that's a real man. And that, to me, shows the strength of the man. Do you have any dating advice for Armenian girls? I would say um, if you meet somebody who is Armenian, it's great. But, you know, my ex-husband was Armenian, and unfortunately it didn't work out. But my fiancé is not Armenian, is Cuban, and he's such a perfect gentleman. Even when it's raining and we have snow here, and he's parked in front of the garage door, and I have to come out, he will get out under the rain. He will come around, get me, to put me in the car to open and close my door. And it, it's things like that where, you know, every single April 24th, he's at Times Square with me to recognize the Armenian genocide. No matter what phone calls he gets at the office, no matter what threats he gets. He does get threats, huh? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. And, you know, a lot of times when issues are brought up, he does talk about the Armenians and the genocide. And, you know, he I've seen him personally go up to different senators uh, in the Senate dining room and say, if you're going to veto, I'm going to shame you into denying realities that happened in history. Mm. And Sometimes he says things like that when I'm not even around or he thinks I'm not listening. But that, to me, is, you know, it's priceless. He doesn't have even 1% Armenian in him. It definitely doesn't have an Armenian nanny. But still, he believes in the cause and he fought for it. And he could have, you know, tried to pass a bill on many other things and given up on passing the Armenian genocide, but he did it. So to me, that's priceless. Now, every non-Armenian man who wants to date an Armenian woman is going to go do an extensive research, research. on yes. Armenian culture. Yes. He has to. That's what it is. And he has to accept it. And when confronted, he has to, you know, support us and believe in it. And I think that's very, very important because for somebody not to admit or support, and if you're going to deny it, then everything that our families went through, our ancestors went through, was for what? Yeah. So you're diminishing everything they went through. Regarding young girls, you know, to have somebody by your side that believes in what your family went through it is very, very important. Even if he is not Armenian, he becomes, sometimes becomes more Armenian by what he learns about what we went through and appreciates us. I can't imagine many Armenians who are more Armenian or believe in the cause than Bob. I'd say, okay, he's Cuban Armenian. <laughs> No, no, I actually was going to ask you, I was going to say, has, he's an honorary Armenian at this point, right? Like someone, yes. someone has given yes. him an award, right? <laughs> <laughs> he is. And, you know, I, I, to me, it's, it was a priceless, priceless gift. And I know what he went through to try to get it passed. And every single young girl or woman should know that it's, more up to us women to keep the Armenian alive in our children and in our family than it is for the young man because 
usually they're so distracted and we're more focused. So I give us more credit in keeping, you know, that thought. Bottom line, it doesn't matter, Armenian or not, as long as they are supporters of our culture and embrace it and, you know, uh, and love it. And genuinely love it, right? Like, you don't want to be yeah. like, oh, I'm eating Doma again. It's like, he's like, are we eating Doma <laughs> again? You know? <laughs> no, but it's it's funny because sometimes when it's a Sunday, he'll say, are we having Kebe? Are you going to order Kebe? Or what are we having with the Armenian, the Subareg? And, yes. and I've, I've think about it. Wait, you have one day that it's quiet. And, you know, if out of, Three quiet times that he has that, you know, there's no meetings, nothing. One out of the three always asks for the kebbe or the, what was it, the subareg or, you know, w- are we going to an Armenian restaurant? Because we have an area by us in Patterson where they have Middle Eastern and there is an Armenian um, caterer and restaurant. And mm-hmm. he loves it because he knows I love it and I don't have to push it on him. So I love that. See, see? that's important. That's important. You, can't, you know, you want to make sure he's and, like, Subare, instead of like, again. Okay. Yes, yes. And he even said, oh, one of these days, he goes, I want to take your dad to Armenia because my mom has been, but my dad hasn't. And I said, what? I thought he was kidding, but he's not. He goes, we should go see it as a family together. So I would yeah. never have expected that, but he is, he, you know, He's always been supportive of the Armenians, but I think maybe now he's even more open to it. Mm-hmm. And he brings up different topics himself instead of me opening them. Going to Armenia and supporting Armenia is like the ultimate because, you know, we got to preserve what we've got so that we can grow what we have. Yes. Many people ask me, well, what do you think of this topic or what he's doing now? And I said, you know what? I don't ask. Whatever it is, I support him 100% blindly. The only thing I wanted was this. And he passed it much sooner than I thought he would, but because he believed in it. every And he said, every single Thursday, I will be on the floor at 10 to 1 until I go through every single Republican senator. And luckily, we didn't have to go through 53 Republican senators. But... I'm very happy he did it. And I think he also believes in it as much as I do. I thank you and Senator Menendez. Thank you so much. On behalf of myself and the Armenian Report listeners, I was flooded with messages and questions and emotions and reactions. I think people finding out you were the one by his side championing him is going to be so much more impactful for the community, I believe. And I can't wait for people to meet you and hear your story. This is a huge honor for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing the interview. Thank you for clarifying all the, you know, facts yeah. uh, about Annie and other ones. And for me, if I have to say something, I thank you very much for, you know, asking the questions and wanting to clarify them. There you have it, folks. What an incredible story. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget to leave your comments. Please make sure you are subscribed to our YouTube channel and you're following us on Facebook and Instagram because our daily news stories go into Instagram stories and Facebook stories. So make sure you are following along over there and please help us share the word with your family and your friends and your community to follow us along. Thank you to Nadine. Thank you to Senator Bob Menendez. Thank you to all the Armenian organizations who fought alongside for this historic day. Special shout out to our brand partners and monthly donors. This would not be possible without your support, and you know it. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. December 12th, we will be out of our homes, and we will celebrate that historic day since we were unable to commemorate April 24th this year. Be safe, everyone. I love you guys. Thank you always. And I'll see you in my next interview. See you then.